So what have you learned from the successes? And then maybe what have you learned from the ones that haven't been successes? You know, again, as I said at the beginning, experience is making mistakes and learning from mistakes. And uh, unfortunately, as students, you haven't made many mistakes yet. If you know, you've gotten to Oxford at this point in your career, the biggest risk is you probably haven't screwed up a lot. And so you know, the risk of that is when data comes across your desk that's inconsistent with your being successful, you're less likely to pay attention to it than if you've made a few mistakes. So I encourage you to make some mistakes. Um, and uh, actually, I, I've made plenty of, over the course of my career, and I think I've been very successful uh, over time, but it's not been a straight line up. In fact, I had, if, if I were a stock, it would look something like this after business school, you know, and then, <laughs> and so the concern is whether this is coming, you know, <laughs> but, but so far, you know, we've, we've, you know, the overall trend has generally been positive, but, you know, there, there are certainly bumps along the way, and uh, JCPenney is a company uh, that we invested in that we knew on the way in was a much higher risk situation than a Canadian Pacific, so JCPenney, for those of you who are not familiar, is a 112-year-old American sort of iconic retailer that's certainly way past its prime. It probably peaked 25 or 30 years ago. Again, another example, you had James Cash Penny, who founded the company. He died, I think, in the early 70s. And there's a pretty good correlation between when the founder goes and when the company goes. Um, and part of that has to do with governance, which is a, a topic I'm sure we'll get to. Um, but the time we invested, JCPenney stock was down from 80 to about $20 a share. Uh, it was trading at about four times operating income. It had lots of assets lying around in the company that were non-core assets. It had a very bloated expense uh, base. And it was generating very little sales per square foot. It was a very underachieving retailer. And part of that is the brand had become somewhat tired. And they had gone to a very highly discount-oriented model where they'd <coughs> mark a, a dress at $40 and they wouldn't sell any at that price. And a week later, they'd mark it to 20 And they probably wouldn't sell many at that price. And then they would send you a coupon where you got $10 off. And then they'd start to sell a few. And then if you used your credit card, you got $4 off. And if you bought this moment, you got another $5 off. And eventually it was, you know, 8 bucks or whatever. And they sell a lot of them at that price. And, um, but this was undifferentiated merchandise. And the thesis was um, this company has actually still a brand, well, faded, uh, restorable. And uh, because they were created over the last 112 years, they actually own about 112 million square feet of some of the best real estate in the shopping mall, in the shopping malls, uh, in the shopping uh, real estate uh, industry. So they own or have very long-term leaseholds at very low rents. And we said, look, this is a great platform to rebuild the company. And we bought a 16% stake in the company. Uh, we <coughs> I was invited to join the board. I, I joined the board with uh, a, a friend who bought 10% uh, along with us. So we owned together 26% of the company. We both joined the board. We were two of 11 directors. Um, and the CEO was 64. Uh, and uh, the board was very much focused on succession, as any board should be generally, but partic particularly when their CEO is in his mid-60s. And uh, we helped the board with succession, and there was a candidate uh, that kept surfacing as the best guy in retail. And this guy's name is Ron Johnson, and he had an ideal background. He didn't go to the Oxford Business School, but he, or Saeed, he went to Harvard Business School. Uh, and he graduated, he went to work for Mervyn's. His dream in life was to reinvent the department store. And Mervyn's was kind of a dying department store. It was acquired by Target. So he spent a few years at Mervyn's. He spent 10 or 11 years at Target, which is probably the best-run U.S. discount department store. And then he was hired by Steve Jobs uh, to build the Apple store from a blank sheet of paper. And he did an absolutely incredible job. And we said, look, you couldn't ask for a better background to do what we're trying to do here, reinvent the department store, um, combine the Apple customer store experience with uh, you know, kind of some of the Target uh, brand excellence and cost management. And the problem was recruiting him. He was very happy living in you know, Atherton, California. He had uh, three, four hundred million dollars of restricted stock in Apple, a hundred million of which he was going to lose if he left. And he had kids who were in, you know, 13, 15 years old in the middle of their, you know, a time when parents don't like to move. But I managed to convince him to take the job. And uh, he walked away from a hundred million of restricted stock. Uh, we gave him 50 million to make up for it, but he still took a loss when he took the job. And then he invested 50 million dollars in seven year options that he bought with his own money that he couldn't sell for six years. So I thought this is the absolute perfect thing. We have the best guy, we've got a great platform at a really cheap price, we have the perfect alignment of incentives, and I thought, it's done. But it didn't work. But it didn't work. <laughs> and, uh, and so Ron got started in November of uh, 2011, and he proceeded to make a series of changes, um, many of them very favorable. Among them, he took a very hard look at the cost structure and found about a billion dollars that he could take out of the cost structure of the business. We took a hard look at all the non-core assets, and we monetized about $600 million of the non-core assets. So far, so good. 
And then he launched a business plan to convert the JCPenney store into basically a mini shopping mall, uh, a Selfridges type model where there were a series of uh, brands, each of which would have their own kind of presence in the store. And then you'd have a consolidated checkout you know, with a wireless experience and sort of this Apple-like uh, customer service experience. And he sold this idea to brands that heretofore wouldn't be willing to go into JCPenney. And the guy's very charismatic. It was a great idea. And he had a whole bunch of brands that he got from around the world who were excited about opening up inside JCPenney. And he went to work. But he made one very significant strategic <coughs> mistake. This whole notion of what he almost called fraudulent pricing, this overpricing an item and then marking it down and marking it down in coupons. He said, look, this is a waste of time. Let's just mark it at the price. The consumer knows the fair price. Because when you looked at those $40 dresses and $40 shirts, they all sold it for something like $12.30 on average, and very little sold at any other price. He said, let's just mark it at 12 bucks. The consumer understands value. We can save a huge amount of, you know, the company had spent an enormous amount of man hours actually changing signs. If you think about how often they're constantly repricing and reticketing and changing signs, it made the stores look really cluttered. And, you know, it sounded like a brilliant idea. And Apple, the Apple experience was not about testing. So instead of trying this out in one or two stores or in a region, he rolled it out across the country. And it failed. And the customer who had become accustomed to getting coupons in their Sunday circular, all of a sudden the coupons weren't there, and so they decided not to come. And we lost about a third of our customers after about 12 months. And the great thing about a retail business, if you get it right, is this business has enormous operating leverage, right? Because you've got a f substantial fixed cost base, but once you start generating additional sales, it almost all drops to the bottom, a lot of it drops to the bottom line. Well, the you know, only problem with leverage, as you learn in business school, is it works in reverse. Mm -hmm. And so all of a sudden, the company was losing huge amounts of money after having spent a ton of money on capital, rebuilding, and uh, redesigning these stores. And we found ourselves in a turnaround 15 months after he retired. And we had to replace him. And the lesson? There are many. Um, so number one, this was what I call an extreme makeover of a company. And when you do an extreme makeover, it requires perfect board alignment uh, and backing for the CEO. And uh, we didn't have that. Number one, we were one of 11 directors on the board. And there was still a, uh, while it had it worked perfectly from the beginning, there wouldn't have been a problem. As things got dicier, there was a divergence of opinion on the board of what to do and when to do it and who to hire. So I think that's one interesting lesson. I don't think I'll ever go on a board and be one of 11 anymore. I like going on with a mandate like in Canadian Pacific. Um, two, you know, I think Ron is an incredible talent, but I don't think, like the students in the room, uh, he'd ever made a mistake before. And I think it was, as the data kept coming back, you know, Ron still had a lot of confidence it was going to work, and you've got to back your CEO and give, and, and give, him, and give him rope. And I think uh, Ron will be, and I think he'd say this today, he'll be a much better CEO the next time, because having had a big negative experience like this. I think third, retail is one of the businesses where you can really test, right? You can take a region, you can take a store, uh, and you can try things out and rejigger them and test them. And I think, uh, you know, the Apple experience, Steve Jobs was all about the customer doesn't know what he or she wants. I know what the customer wants. And, it, and Steve Jobs, you know, got it right. I think in retail, you know, there's a kind of a saying, the customer knows what he or she wants. And I think you really have to listen to that. Um, so while I actually, I, I still love the vision for JCPenney, I think it was right. I think the execution was difficult. Um, and... Uh, you know, to do something like that, and also in the public domain, right, this is a major change, and the company was constantly being harassed by the press, and Ron was attacked. I think it makes it difficult to make decisions in that kind of a public